What's happening to YouTube? I have a show called The John Lovell Show. It's not very creatively named, but what you see each week is a smaller part of that show. Typically, it revolves around one big hot topic. This week's topic, it's about censorship, and it's on the platform that we're actually like sitting. So if I show that, it's just going to get buried immediately. And so we're actually holding back that major subject and just putting it on watchwpsn.com. That's where you go to support us, and you can get the app and all that jazz. Instead, we're going to give you the second half of the show. It's what you never get to see. Hot topics, Q and ambush section. You guys have written in, asked me questions, and I'm going to answer them live on the spot for better or for worse. And then we have a dad joke section. And so it should be great fun. Today, what you'll be getting into is the cell phone outage thing. Also, we're going to talk about, oh, help us, Trump's new sneaker line. Also, we're going to talk about illegal immigration and violence that's been done. There's a recent case, a high profile case that I want to talk about. It's all starting uh, right now. Here we go, guys. place we're going to start first, John, I want you to think back to the young John, the shoes that you felt like you were top of the world, king for the I day. Do. I mean, I had to beg my uh, mom for them for like a year, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. They, they kind of looked like, uh, I don't know, some like aquatic swordfish or like a manta ray. <laughs> and it had like these two straps that came back and hooked over and they just looked so cool. I'd never wanted a pair of shoes so bad. ever <laughs> as much as I wanted those. And finally... I got them. And man, I could run so fast. I could jump so high. I bet I'd still think they were cool. That's how cool they I were. I got the shoes for 40-year-old John because last week Trump came out. He's selling some new kicks. Here's from the AP. Former President Donald Trump made a highly, yeah, yeah, highly unusual stop at SneakerCon, a gathering that bills itself as the greatest sneaker show on earth. Trump, uh, this is according to the AP, so here, this is great. Trump was met with loud boos. There's a lot of emotion in this room. As well as cheers. Thank you. And Who's then, reporting on this? This is AP. Actually, this is AP. Oh, Associated Press. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gee. <laughs> Loud boos and small cheers at the Philadelphia Convention Center as he introduced the first ever Trump branded Never Surrender high top sneakers for $399. These high tops you're looking at are shiny gold with an American flag on the back and a big fat T on the side. Aren't these just the best? Don't you love these? That's the real deal. I do not. You do. I do not. <laughs> what I, 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 you? I, I hate this idea. What? I hate the shoes. Uh, no. I hate that he's doing it in the first place. Oh, come on. Just seems so cartoonish to me. Now, uh, I think that he is shouldering wild attacks. So, man, if you gotta, if you gotta sell some commemorative EFT action card graphics, and you gotta, hey, John. overpriced sneakers, do whatever you need to do, but. Man, hey, I got bad news for you. I went to the website. So the limited run, the first, the thousand limited run is already sold out. So you have missed your window. I hate it. To get these sneakers. I do not want those sneakers. But this is one of those areas where I think it's it's actually really fun. This is why I think why, why we love Trump. It is fun. This is why we love Trump because Barack Obama would, he would have done the same thing. Barack Obama would not have done this. He told Barack Obama. Yes, no, he, yes, would, he not. would Look, if Barack Absolutely o- not. Because Barack Obama could have done this and didn't. <laughs> So they say too he would have. They're both former presidents, but one has done it and the other hasn't. Now I am no fan of Obama. I never voted for Obama. I did vote for Trump, and next time I'm going to vote for Trump as well. Here, obviously, here, watch this. Uh, but watch no, I don't do. like that he made a line of sneakers. But look, if Barack Obama had done this, the AP report would have gone like this: bold and brilliant move That's by the true. former president, That's really true. getting down to the street level with the average common Joe. The Barack Obama line selling for five thousand dollars, and and the media would be just they, they would have bought them i agree with that i agree with that <laughs> and by the way the associated press on their uh the loud booze uh, i bet what yeah. the, what ap didn't point out was it was the ap guys that were there that were <laughs> the, doing the booing the press corps on the back that were <laughs> there were loud booze <laughs> that we ourselves did hey let's move into a a subject that's uh, often taken for granted till it's not and that's communications uh this is according to daily wire here Tens of thousands of Americans across the country last week had their cellular service disrupted as AT&T's network was reportedly down for over 60,000 customers. And John, 
This is why you need to have your landline. Do you have a landline? I have a landline. Is it for that reason? No, my wife just liked the idea of having a landline, and she wanted an old school phone. Yeah. We also didn't want to buy our young kids phones, but we uh, realized, gotcha. hey, in an emergency or something like that, well, to they know home. to, hey, hold up the phone to mama's incapacitated face to unlock it and call 911. But uh, for the kids to be able to call grandparents or to be able to call in an emergency or cell phones mm -hmm. are down, something like that, yeah. uh, we have a landline patched in. So the kids have a, you know, a, a legend of all the different people to call and their respective numbers. And so the kids can mm -hmm. use that landline. Now, uh, we have a landline at the house, but also... I've had this for years, and I carry it around in like a, a, a fair day sleeve. Yeah, what's that thing uh, you got this there? This is my satellite phone. So That is wild. I should be able to call anyone on the planet from this. And specifically, if cell phone stuff goes down, I can use my satellite phone to call my wife on the landline. Additionally... I have these uh, just little bow fangs. I've got a couple bow fangs in here with different yeah. batteries, and and yeah. then this is all EMP protected. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the this bag is not hey, EMP, hey, so uh, but the sleeve it goes into is a huge sleeve for it. Yeah. What are the price points for the bow fangs, and what's the price point for a satellite phone? Out of curiosity, bow fangs are super cheap. I mean, they're like thirty bucks, and they work pretty good. You can yeah. get them with five, six, eight watts or something. Yeah. Um, use of channels other than just the like FRS channels requires a ham radio license. But if it's like down grid, it's not like FCC guys are going to become looking for you, like knocking down doors. I'm like, I'm just going to do whatever I want. Mm. However, the satellite phones are very expensive to get. They're going to be like a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars or something crazy. Biden's economy, I have no idea what yeah. it is. Like, $33,000 now. I, I don't know what the jump is. But then also what sucks is there's a monthly service fee. Mine's 65 bucks a month, and that gives me 10 minutes of talking each Interesting. month. Interesting. Uh, and then it goes, and that's free 10 minutes, and then it's like $1.65 a minute after that. And so it's this is not something that you want to just be like, hey, guys, just wanted to... What's Shoot the breeze. This is emergency communication kind of things. And because I travel so much, mm. and then I'll also get into areas that don't have signal. I want to be able to have that. So uh, say we're teaching a warrior poet rifle class and we're out in the boonies on this range in Arizona, yeah. no cell phone signal. Well, I can call medical now in case there's an emergency via my sat phone. And you uh, mentioned that the bow fangs, you called them ham radios. And so those are, those are, it's a ham radio. Those are better than just regular, because you can go to Walmart and buy a little, you know, Motorola thing. Oh, those are walkie talkies. Those are not ham radios. Yeah. A walkie talkie is not nearly what the these are because they look exactly the same no this is way more powerful and you have an incredible amount of options with these hmm. uh, and, and, and the the capability of this little 30 40 dollar uh you know uh ham radio it, it's really quite remarkable the final story uh, i'm going to share is just a, a terrible story just just terrible but it's local to us and i'm going to follow it up with just a really simple question at the end of it but Lake and Hope Riley, a nursing student at University of Georgia, was found dead Thursday after going out on a jog in a wooded area on the University of Georgia campus. Blunt force trauma was the reported cause of death. The man arrested for the murder was a 26-year-old illegal immigrant from Venezuela. He had been detained at the border, released by CPB, arrested then in New York just five months ago for charges related to injury of a child. Uh, but they have released him before ICE could get to him. And then this guy made his way to Athens, Georgia, was living in an apartment about a mile from the university campus. Just one day he woke up and then he killed uh, he killed this beautiful young woman in the prime of her life uh, pursuing a nursing degree. And the question I have is, whose fault is this? Uh, so the fault of the murder is the murderers. So the guy who killed her, it is his fault. However, uh, there's also the fault of how in the world was this person who was obviously dangerous and obviously committed crimes and was obviously not supposed to be in the United States in the first place, an illegal alien, there is culpability that should be assigned to the federal government, to the Biden administration, without question. She didn't have to die. Yeah, That illegal alien should not have been here. Now that girl is dead. Uh, she doesn't get a future because Biden administration wanted a wave of illegal immigrants so that he could secure future elections. 
uh, by granting them eventual citizenship. And so it is the virtue signaling of the authoritarian left that always leads to bloody, uh, bloody consequences, and this is it. All right. Well, we're going to leave those hot topics behind, and we are going to head over to our Q and ambush. The first question I have for you today comes from Will Frito, and he wonders about church security. So the question goes like this. Hey, John, what is the best stepping off point for starting a church security team? For a small church, what, what type of SOPs, strategies, and good practices would you recommend? First and foremost, I want to make sure kids are secured. Uh, I want to make sure the hard entry points, exit points are secured during service. So really, you just want one real path that people come into the kids area and kids can't just open up a side door. Adults don't know and they just wander out or people from outside are able to just open a door and come in. You really need to be able to protect the kids. And mm -hmm. so that includes watching your paths of entry and exit. Secure those. Uh, also, you're going to want responsible people watching over the kids, and this means background checks. You're going to watch sex offender registry. You're going to really be careful who is actually monitoring the kids because predators abound. Uh, the next thing is I want to ensure that we have some type of church security team. Somebody's just looking uh, for folks that would want to come in to a small church that doesn't have any assets uh, but are wondering, hey, is this shooting fish in a barrel? Is this an easy, soft target? And what you want is you want strong men uh, who are able to meet the eye line of that uh, bad guy who's coming in, who is doing their scans, and what they're looking for is somebody who might put up resistance. This leads to a next thing that you could do as a church who wants to make sure that your congregation's really safe. Probably one of the best things you could do is just have a cop there. If a bad guy that? sees a cop car in the parking lot, they're going to go find a different church. Mm. Additionally, having a police officer in your congregation, if something goes wrong, say somebody's just a uh, crackpot, they're, they're screaming, they're causing a scene, or you got somebody trying to take home a kid and they got a restraining order against and you don't know how to do that and you got a security team and the security team doesn't know what to do, and yeah. all of a sudden they put hands on somebody— well, that, that's assault. You're not allowed to do that necessarily. Mm -hmm. And now you've incurred tremendous liability on the church. The moment you touch someone and you're not expressly legally allowed to do that. And so when you have a police officer, it can go much different. So having cops be an integral part of your security plan for your church is a really, really good idea. It's going to protect you from liability, and it's probably going to keep bad guys from ever even trying to attack. Talking about the church security team, I know that there's a handful of uh, warrior poets out there, because I've gotten the emails I got, you know, from Matt, Michael, James, and, and others. They're wondering about that Senate Bill 3589 that uh, it hasn't been passed, but that's that one that basically outlaws para paramilitary training. I don't know if you've seen anything much about that, but it seems to be that uh, it, if you train together with other guys, it's called paramil paramilitary, and they're looking to ban that and that would be used to eliminate nearly all civilian firearms training and church security teams. And I, you know, it hasn't passed yet, so this is kind of a thought experiment, but uh, if that were to pass, uh, what advice would you have for guys that, that have put together church security teams and are still interested in protecting their church? Would you just I ignore that at that point, or what? Uh, so I have the Second Amendment, which means the government is not allowed to pass any law that infringes upon the exercise of the Second Amendment or a well-regulated militia, and so you just do whatever you want. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna listen to that. I'm gonna do whatever I want. Screw that. that, that that's that's an illegal law. That's an illegal law, and I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna follow that. That that's ridiculous. Keep on driving on, guys. All right. Hey, let's head into the second question for you. It comes from Mike. Mike doesn't want to be a wanker, but also thinks a woman can't have a wife. So here it goes. Hey, John. I have two kids with one on the way. My wife and I were both raised in Christian homes and are followers of Christ and happily married for six years. I have two sisters who've lost their way. One sister is a lesbian with a wife who wants to be part of our life and our kids' lives, but I struggle exposing my kids to that lifestyle, especially at such impressionable age, three years and 16 months, respectively. I pray daily my sister's heart will be softened and see the sin in her life, but at this point she doesn't see that anything she's doing is wrong. We see her about two to four times a year as I try to limit her interactions with my kids. 
I struggle with not wanting to ostracize my sister while still showing her the love of Christ. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, Mike. Mm. So how old are the kids? Uh, three years and 16 months with a newborn on the way. Okay, cool. I hear where he's coming from, and he wants to protect his family and his values, and that's important, especially with little kids. Little kids, they'll interpret the entire world through the context of family. They, they, they'll understand before anything else, they'll understand there's a mommy, and there's a daddy, and there's a baby, you know, and there's a, everything in the world, whether it's boy or girl, their entire world is built in the order of family. And so that's really, really important for years and years. Now, I actually had this exact scenario or almost exact scenario play out in my family. And so this is not a thought experiment. This is a memory for me. Uh, so on the one hand of like, hey, uh, you got family or people really close uh, that are gay and uh, you don't want your kids having mixed signals about what marriage means uh, uh, and mom and dad, and that's confusing. That They're too young for that conversation. And so uh, you're saying, like, all right, well, don't be around or be around, but not much around of like, when they're that young, they're not going to see any lifestyle. They just realize, hey, two women have entered into our sphere. To them, they, they have no idea. They have no context. Now, uh, and so I, I didn't have a problem with that of like they're coming in. Now, if they start like making out on the couch or something in front of your kids, now the lifestyle has entered and now you have a big problem with that. Now my kids are seeing something and they're too young to understand this and I don't have to speak to it. And uh, I, this is, they're too young uh, for this, for them to be exposed to this. Like if is similarly, let, let's, let's take the social stigma of gay away from this episode uh, for just a moment and say, all right, instead of a gay couple, just say you had a uh, husband, wife, and this husband that she married has a really, really foul mouth. Just can't help himself. Curses every single moment, cursing all the time, tells really crude, nasty jokes, just really inappropriate all the time. Well, f a condition for him coming is, is man, hey, listen, you can talk however you want, wherever you want, but when you enter into my home and you're around my kids, you have to clean up your language. You have to. And let's just say he refuses. So I'm like, well, then you can't be around my kids, period. You get to protect your kids from different ideas and different language. They're your kids. You get to do that. And the idea is, is there is a standard that is healthy, and there is a perversion that is not healthy. And you get to protect your kids from what is damaging to them. But I don't think the just presence of uh, sister and, you know, her gay partner, you know, them just being there. It's not like they're making out or anything. They're just there or around. And um, later you're going to have to have conversations uh, about, you know, what marriage actually means and, and how y'all think about your sister and her partner. And, and you can talk about that once they're old enough to do that. But anyway, that's how we kind of navigated it. Because on the one hand of like, hey, yeah, I don't agree with a sister in this, in, in this, their context, uh, and their lifestyle and, and that value. Uh, but at the same time, I'm like, I, I still love my, I, I love this person. And I don't want to use my kids as a cudgel to, sh you know, beat you over the head. And you're like, no, you can't have anything to do with me. I'm like, no, 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 I, I still want to be around you and I still love you. Uh, so anyway, we didn't cut everyone off. You know, or we didn't cut the, these, uh, our particular example off. How did they receive the conversation that you must have had with them concerning what the rules for your house is concerning we that? We didn't you know? really give that because it's not like something that they were wanting to do anyway. They weren't okay. going to be tacky like that. So yeah, yeah. they weren't like making out or being inappropriate or anything like yeah. that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Of like, you know, when you have men, man and wife over, you, you're not seeing them like yeah, round and second base, you know, yeah. in, in the pantry during yeah. your family gathering. Anyway, that's not really a thing that's happening. And so for us, uh, we didn't have a hard conversation on that. Yeah. We didn't have anything like that. They just, they just knew. Now, so, if, if they didn't have that and they wanted to kind of make a point, well, now you're forcing my hand. Well, hey, you can't do that around my kids. We really want you here love you but if you do like this if if you 
are interacting that way around my kids, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Or at least the partner leaves and the sister stays. Yeah. So the sister can be here and the partner has to go. And so that's the cost. I'm like, well, you don't love so-and-so and you hate me. I'm like, no, no, no. You just can't do that in front of my kid. It's about the kid. Uh, that's all. Love you. Please stay. But here's a condition. Uh, right. And so. Yeah. And I, well, I think that what might be really encouraging for some of our viewers in this is the fact that you have uh, been in a situation like that. And, and I have been in this situation. I wasn't. You have been in this situation. Some details shifted, but it was this situation. And um, I think what's really encouraging is that the, the at least some people have heard from your mouth that there are situations where both parties can find an equitable way to still get together and not have that yeah. thing be the, the center of the thing. Yeah, and we love those relatives. Yeah. And I, I think they love us, too. Of yeah. Like, my wife and I are probably more loved within our family than anyone else in the family. Uh, because Interesting. We, we've been really awesome to them. And yeah, because guys, as people know, we're, we've been, John's not shy about what he thinks. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyway, so there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, the next question we have here comes from Alex. Alex wonders how to get back up again. He says, hey, John, mm. I work in public service, and earlier this year, one of my guys was killed in the line of duty. Since then, months later, I'm still in a pretty hard slump at work. I lack motivation and have lost some hope in what I thought was my calling, but I hope still is. What advice would you give me or someone in my boat how to regain motiv mo motivation, maintain discipline, or maybe even decide when to jump ship? Thanks, man, and God bless. Mm. That's awful. Sorry, man. I feel that. I sound depressed. Uh, I, I would want to know what kind of... some Something's broke and something's not uh, getting some healing in you that needs, needs some healing. There's a... There's a deeper root uh, right there, and I don't know exactly what that is. It could be that, you know, uh, the death of your friend has triggered something, um, and it may you may be thinking it's mostly that, but it's actually something else in conjunction with that. I, I have no idea, um, but I'd, I'd take a hard look of what gives you the most amount of joy. I've worked a lot of jobs, and... Uh, some of them were more enjoyable than others. I really like my career now because I'm able to really align uh, passion and purpose and uh, also make a living doing it. And that that's really, really cool. But most jobs aren't like my job. Most jobs, if you go and you try to be a good uh, employee or worker and you make a good impact and you provide a service and maybe it's not as kind of like noble and outward reaching. You're in public service, so yours happens to be. Service is amazing. We're all supposed, supposed to serve, and you make the world safer and make the world better, and so that's a really cool thing. And so your profession does check out. However, I know in public service can also be a thankless job. It could be a grind. Uh, you could be unappreciated in that as well. Uh, I would say, though, in all the different jobs I've had, in the vast majority of them, it wasn't my job. I needed it to not be too much of a bummer. But I didn't need it to really kind of self-actualize, uh, give me my sense of self and identity. That came from me, uh, from my creator. It also comes in large part from, you know, family of like, man, most of the time, even when I'm working now at a job that I love, I just want to be home with my family all the time. That's what I want. Really, but even when I'm traveling, I'm doing real cool stuff. I want to be home with my family all the time. That's a sense of great joy. And uh, that's... Uh, that, that's something that makes the grind worth it. The cure for burnout isn't try harder. That, that'll, that'll give you some um, temporal immediate gains that make you feel better in some ways, but it's not causing a root issue. In short term, you win. In the longer term, you lose. And so I don't know what's going on with you. Hopefully there was something in there that landed. All right, John, we're going to wrap it out from Joan. Joan's got a question here. She wants to know what happened to that poster. She says, uh, John, not really a Q and ambush question, but I noticed the Braveheart poster is no longer on the wall behind you. Any reason for that? Just curious. Yeah, I, I think that was down for like weeks because uh, there's our <laughs> Band of Brothers one. And then the Braveheart one was down. And so it was just in this corner. And I hadn't noticed no, he, that. He, none of us had. So it was down for a while. And I just kind of came Before in the Philly, studio yeah. one day and I looked at it and I'm like, I. 
You do not know what's happened, but it just fell off and the frame was like broken and I taped it back last week and we hung it. So uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Hey, um, Mel Gibson, he flexed freedom so hard that he fell right off the wall. That's right. <laughs> Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. I had fun, even though some of it was just rain clouds and more bad news. We had some uh, good, encouraging stuff and helpful stuff for you along the way, too. So Warrior Poets, keep training hard, keep training smart, do all that stuff, and here's some dad jokes. See you guys. What's Jesus' favorite car? A Chrysler. Why do the corners of the rooms always feel warmer than the rest of the rooms? Because they're 90 degrees. Guess what happens when you touch Dwayne Johnson's butt? What? You hit rock bottom. Hey, Everett. Do you know why Santa's bringing us coal this year? Because our firewood's been very naughty. <laughs> <laughs>